All right, welcome to chapter seven, section three, similarity and transformations. This is for math eight. So the first thing, first couple things you should see on your screen, you should see a due date here. I don't see it on my teacher preview, but you will see it on your student screen. Uh, the second thing is the number of attempts. You always have unlimited attempts on your homework tests and quizzes. Uh, the number of questions just lets you know how many questions there are on this particular assignment. Grading policy is best score, so whichever attempt is the best one is the one you keep. Partial credit is enabled, uh, so if you answer one of four questions correctly, you get credit for one question, or however many you've answered correctly. Um, please remember, once you start your homework, you must finish it before you can work on anything else. So what that means is once I click Start here, in the bottom right corner, I will see the Submit Assignment button. I don't see it on my teacher preview, but you will see it on your student side. So two big reasons you want to click that button. Number one, before you leave the screen, you have to click this button. So you don't want to close the screen, you don't want to close your computer. Um, number one, it will stop the system from locking you out of all of your other assignments, just like that first screen tells you. Um, if you just close your screen or close this tab, it's going to assume you want to leave this attempt open. Remember, you have unlimited attempts. There's no reason to leave this attempt open. So as long as you have green check marks, if you can answer some of these questions, it's not going to make you start over. You start off exactly where you left off. Make sure you have a green check mark. If you've started to answer but haven't finished, it doesn't save that. Um, the other big thing that it does is it affects the grade book when you click submit assignment. So until you click that button, your account's basically paused. We can't even see what you've been working on. So good habit, always, always, always click that button when you're done for that moment. Um, you can come back and you know pick up where you left off. Uh, on the side here, you see explanation, example, and message center. So explanation tells you you're going to lose your question attempt because it's going to give you the answer to this question. So it's not going to give you the answer and then let you, um, you know, come type the answer in. That's not how this works. Um, for example, it's going to give you something very similar to what you're looking at. So we have four figures here. We're going to decide if they're congruent or similar. So it walks you through how to decide that. Um, you can close this, open another example that does not, you know, give you any kind of penalty at all. You can look at examples as many times as you want. You can also message your teacher directly from the screen so that we can kind of see where to come help you. All right, so on this one, just like I said on the example, which pairs of figures are congruent and which are similar? So we've been dealing with congruence for about a chapter and a half now. Um, all of chapter six and, you know, about two sections of chapter seven here um, have been dealing with congruence. Congruence means the same size and shape, exactly the same shape. So not just two triangles, but the same type or shape of triangle. Um, I know that sounds funny, but um, so congruent is not just the same shape, but also the same size. Similar means it's exactly the same shape, but different sizes. So one will be bigger and one will be smaller, but they need to be the same shape. I need to be able to turn one into the other. Um, so if we look at this one, these triangles do not look similar. They don't even look like the same type of triangle. We have two, two, and then this slope is two over two. This has two and one. So if I were to multiply, you know, this guy by two to get to the, the length from the small one to the large one, it wouldn't work for the bottom of the triangle because two times two is not two, it'd be four. So it should be quite a bit bigger. Um, so this one is not congruent. They're not the same shape or the same size. And they're not similar because they're, they're not the same shape. So they have to be the same shape to be both congruent and similar. Um, the size is what determines the congruency. So these are both circles. We can definitely see that. So um, it doesn't matter the circles at all. As long as you see a circle, not an oval, but circles, they are both, um, or they're similar. So I know they're already similar because they're both similar, or both circles. Congruent, that depends on if they're the same size. So I just want to take a look at a cross here. I have four across and I have four down. I have four down, I have four across. So they have the same diameter, um, which means that they are the same size circles. Um, so definitely they're both congruent um, and they are also similar. Um, if they are congruent, they are immediately similar. Um, being similar does not make them congruent. So don't go back and forth with that. One means the other, but the other does not mean um, congruent. So just be careful with your definitions. Um, so for this one, we definitely see that they're both rectangles. We need to make sure that they're um, similar, meaning that I can change maybe this guy into this one. So I have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. 
So if I wanted to change this length into this length, I'd have to multiply by 2. 3 times 2 gives me 6. So, um, and I can even kind of draw this out over here. So I have 3 tall, and I'd go 6 tall. So I have to multiply by 2 to get from 3 to 6. Now along the bottom I have 1, and I have 2. So I need to do the same thing in order for it to be considered similar. So if I'm multiplying by 2, if I have to multiply by 2 to get to this one, which I do. So this works and this works. I multiply by 2 for both lengths, um, for the, the width and the length. So they are congruent, or sorry, they are similar, but they're not congruent because they're different sizes. So this guy's obviously a little bigger than this one. So they're not congruent, but they are similar. So let's look at these little T guys. So we have this T like this. So for the, the bottom one, it's 1, 2, um, this is a length of 1, 1, and then across the top is 3. So what I want to do is make sure that this other T, and it doesn't have to match necessarily, I know this is very messy, but so I have 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So what I want to do is make sure, am I multiplying by the same number each time? So if I want to go from 1 to 2, I would multiply by 2. And let's check, do all the other ones work? 2 times 2 is 4. Perfect. 1 times 2 is 2. And then again, 2. So those work. And then 3 times 2 is 6. So all of those changes map from one to the other. Once I know, okay, one of the sides, I have to multiply by by a number to get from one to the other, all of the sides need to be multiplied by that same number in order for it to be considered similar. Again, very obviously different sizes, so they are not congruent. All right, go ahead and go to the next guy here. So the next one, we're gonna be looking at the effect of dilation on the side length. Um, so remember, dilation is one of our transformations where we're changing the size. So if we, and this, we're going to specifically look at, you know, what are we multiplying by, um, just like we did on this one. Um, so we're, we're going to do it a little bit neater, hopefully, because um, that was a little sloppy that first time. Um, so for the figure, do a dilation centered at the origin with a scale factor of three, then answer the um, each part. So with this one, if we have this little slider for the dilation, if I go down, we notice it gets smaller, right? If I go up, we notice it gets bigger. So this one though is right on top. So one is kind of like 100% or one item, the item. If I go more than one, I'm getting bigger. So any number, any scale factor bigger than one is gonna be bigger. Any scale factor smaller than one or a fraction is going to be smaller. Hopefully we understand that a fraction of something is a piece of it, right? So it's getting smaller. Um, so if we look at this, we want to scooch this dilation over to 3 because that's what they've asked us to do, scale factor of 3. So the longest side, um, the longest side length of the original figure is, and it would be this bottom one, that's the longest side is 3 units. The longest side of this one would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, did I do that right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There we go. I missed one when I first counted it. So it's 9 units long for the longest side of the final figure. Now we're going to fill in the blank to make the statement true. So the longest side of, of the final figure is equal to what times the longest side of the original figure? So what are we multiplying by? That's what they're asking. Well, it's a scale factor of 3, just like we were doing in that last figure. We're going to multiply by the same number on each side, so we're going to multiply by 3 on each side. And this is true of all the sides, not just the longest side. Um, so a dilation with a positive scale factor, greater than 1, and it needs to be positive. We're not going to have a negative scale factor. You're not going to have less than 0 of an item. That doesn't quite make sense. It needs to be positive um, scale factor. And if it's greater than 1, just like we tested here, it's going to get bigger, right? It, the final figure will be larger, so that's true. If it's a scale factor less than 1, but it's positive, 
So a fraction, it's going to be smaller than the final, or the original figure. So it just depends on what you're looking at. The original figure and the final figure are similar. And that's true because we're changing each side by the same amount. We're changing each by the scale factor of three. So if we were to actually test these out, um, the length here would be multiplied by three to get this length, this new diagonal length, and same thing on the other side. And then the top, I can even see this is one and now it's three. So I can very easily tell, you know, the sides that I can count that they're being multiplied by three. They're all um, multiplied by the same scale factor. Um, all right, so we are going to look at determining if figures are related by dilation in the next one. So with this one, we literally just want to decide um, using this little slide bar, um, only with dilation can I turn the solid figure into the dotted figure. So if I'm going larger, well, that's going to get bigger. I don't want to go larger. I want to get smaller. I want to use a fraction. So I just want to see, and yet I'd go down, and this is a fourth because there's four tick marks, so that's one-fourth. So I'd be dividing all of the sides by four. So I can even test that. This is eight long. If I counted that, this is only two. And each side, since it's square, should be the same. It's eight, 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 eight. Now it's two, 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 two. So I'm dividing each side by four, one-fourth. Means I'm dividing by four. All right, so this guy, I can already see this one's going side to side. This one's kind of laying on its side, and this one's tall. So I know no matter what I do, I'm not going to be able to map that with dilation. That would need a rotation also. But remember, I'm only using dilation on this one, so I'm going to say not possible. All right, let's do one more. Last one for the section. Um, we are going to determine if figures are similar and related by sequence of transformations. So with this one, we're looking for a sequence of, of transformations. So what I like to do on this guy... Oop, Stop doing that. Um, it didn't stop before, right? Okay. I was worried my video stopped for a moment. Oh, silly thing. I don't know why I did that. All right. I want the whole picture there. And where is it? There it is. So let's zoom in on this guy. All right. So I like to take this one and actually map out the, the changes um, that they're trying to give us here. So we're going to reflect a figure over the x-axis and then dilate that result with a scale factor of 2. And what we want to do is decide, will this map figure A, which is the gray one, onto figure B? So a very easy way to do this is to just test it out. Let's see what happens when we do this. Um, so I'm going to bring my pen size down a little bit and I'll change colors as we go so I can kind of see. So the first one here I'll do in red. So figure A, I'm going to reflect over the x-axis. So here's my x-axis. And I just want to make sure it's the same units away. So it's 3 down. I'm going to go 1, 2, 3 up. It's 1 down. So it's going to be 1 here and 1 here. And then this one is 3 away, 3 away. So this is reflected over the x-axis. But now I also need to dilate it with a scale factor of 2 which means that I need to multiply by 2 for everything here. So another way to look at that when we're doing this on, with coordinates is if I look at the actual coordinates, so I have negative 4 and 3, I'm going to multiply these both by 2. So I'd end up with negative 8 and 6, like this. So that would, that would land me over here for negative 8 and 6. Whoops, negative 8 and 6. Um, I could keep going if I wanted to, but I already know it's not going to give me the correct figure. So I'm going to go ahead and stop because that's definitely not working. Um, so let's go with, uh, we'll go with green for the next guy here for Christmassy effect. Uh, so rotate figure A clockwise 180 degrees about the origin. So we had some um, transformation rules. If you don't have this open, this was from, let me see which section was this from? Uh, da, da, da. So I had the, the rotation coordinate rules on um, LP 6 day 7 notes. So there's a nice little table in there that you should have filled in your notes. Um, if you don't have that, definitely you'd want to look up the rotation rules here to make sure that you know how this works because the mapping of the coordinates changes. So with this one, if I want to do 180 degrees, and it doesn't matter if it's clockwise or counterclockwise, because if I'm rotating it, 180 degrees, what it means, and I'll start here, is here's 
here's 180 degrees. It's 90 and then 90 more. Well, if I go counterclockwise, I'd land in the same place. So this one doesn't matter if it's clockwise or counterclockwise for 180. If it says 90 or 270, that matters. You need to pay attention to the clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, so if we're going um, 180 degrees, what it does is it takes the coordinate here, and I'll go, so it's negative 4 and negative 3 for this point here. And what it's going to do, it's not going to flip the numbers. That happens with 90 or 270. What it's just going to do, it's still going to be 4 and 3, but it's going to be positives. So this point will actually land over here. It'll be positive 4, positive 3, like this. Um, and if we can picture this kind of spinning around, it's going to be upside down. Um, and we can even look at this. So this coordinate is negative 2, negative 1. So it's going to turn into 2 and 1. So 2 and 1. And then we have negative 1, negative 1. So that's going to be 1, 1. Um, oh, and it's I was thinking upside down. It's actually just shooting to the side. So it's like kind of like that. Um, for some reason, um, I was even picturing it changing a little more than it is. So this is going to be negative 1, negative 3, which is going to be 1, 3. So now it is rotated 180 degrees. And we have to dilate that result with a scale factor of 2. So I need to multiply everything by 2. So I need these coordinates again. And I need to at least test one of the coordinates. But once I test one of the coordinates, I can just look at the side lengths to determine the rest. Or I could continue to use the coordinates totally up to, you know, preference there. So if I want to do a dilation of 2, I need to multiply by 2. So this should be 8 and 6. So 8 and 6. So that guy does, in fact, work. Um, so I can look at this one now. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2. 1, 2, 3, 4. So 3 times 2 is 6. 2 times 2 is 4, this is 1, this is 2, 1 times 2 is 2, so this does in fact work, this second one. Um, because they're boxes, it means we might be able to check more than one, so we need to keep going. We don't want to stop yet. So now we're going to dilate a figure with a scale factor of 2 centered at the origin. So now we're going to dilate it first. So I'm going to multiply by 2 here. So it's, I'm using this one, the original one. So negative 8 and negative 6, not 3. So I'm going to go negative 8 and negative 6. And then it's just going to, now that I know where I, I'm putting this, it's just going to double. So it was 3 long. I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This was 2. So now 1, 2, 3, 4. It was 1, so it's going to go 2. And now I just want to connect these guys. So this is dilated by a scale factor of 2. And then it says rotate the result 90 degrees clockwise. So clockwise, 90 degrees. Now I have to pay very close attention to what's happening um, to these guys. Because x and y are going to trade positions. That's pretty much true if it's 90 or 270. And it doesn't matter if it's counter or um, counterclockwise or clockwise, but it does depend for these which one is going to turn to um, switch signs. So because it's 90 degrees clockwise, x is going to switch. So x was negative 8, now it's positive 8. And remember, even though I'm switching signs, it's still I'm looking at it, this is x um, when we're looking at this because it goes x, y, and this is y, negative x. This is the rule that we use here. So I'm going to go um, negative 6, but positive 8. Up here, that's where this guy would land. Negative 6, positive 8. Well, that's, odd. that's not going to be over here, so that doesn't work. All right, let's do our last one. We'll do this one in pink. We're going to dilate with a scale factor of 2. All right, done. I'm just going to come back over that with pink. We already did that in the, this one over here. And then translate the result up 10 units. All right, well, that would just mean that I'm going to take this point and I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So that would land here, which means that I would go 3, oh, no, sorry, 2. This guy would go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 
one, two, three, four, five, six. And I think this was also six. One, oh, and I'm counting wrong. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, like that. And then I would connect. Well, and I didn't necessarily need to connect all that as soon as I saw that point, not over here. I know that's not gonna work. That's not where I wanted to land. Um, so those definitely don't work. The only one that works is this one. Because it's a box, I do have the potential for choosing more than one. So just make sure you're, you check each and every one. Um, are the figures A and B similar? Well, I they are similar because I can map this green one onto this blue one here. I They're definitely similar. We just need to use the correct transformations to get them there. So I'm going to say yes, they are similar. All right, so that was section three. I will see you in section four.